Good afternoon. Welcome back. Yeah. Yeah. First program. <laughs> it's our first live Lincoln Symposium in over two years, so so good to be here. My name is George Zamini. I'm the executive director here at History Miami Museum. And on behalf of the staff and the board of trustees, welcome back to our museum. Welcome our members, our guests, our panelists, and our moderator, Harry Holter. It's great seeing everyone again. Presidential Symposium is one of the most popular events that we host each year. It's understandable when considering the scholarship and expertise of our speakers and the diverse topics that have been covered in the last 12 years, all sharing the fascinating background of Lincoln and the Civil War. History Miami Museum strives for excellence in all we do. We cannot maintain the level of quality that our community has come to expect. Without you, our members, we wouldn't be able to do it. You've been supporting us for over 82 years. Your generosity brings this and many other wonderful programs to our community, so thank you. If you're not a member, <laughs> we invite you to experience the community membership as well as enjoy the many discounts and special member access to curated events that, have been, that being a member affords. After the meeting, please stop by the visitor service desk in the lobby. One of our educators will answer your questions and then you can start your membership today. Be sure to join us in the Cultural Plaza right after the symposium, by the way, for a reception. Before I introduce our moderator, I want to express our gratitude to our event sponsors, Gene and Bill Soman, and David Lawrence. I also want to introduce the newest member of our development team uh, and our annual giving manager, membership and annual giving manager, Gina Balaroso. Welcome to the team, Gina. And Hilda's still around, but Gina's going to help you with your membership questions. So. so Harold Holter, our moderator for today's symposium, currently serves as Jonathan F. Fanton, director of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College in New York. Holter is the winner of the 2008 National Humanities Medal and the 2015 Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize. He is one of the country's leading authorities on Lincoln and the political culture of the Civil War era. A prolific writer and lecturer and frequent guest on television, Holter served for 10 years as co-chairman of the U.S. Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission appointed by President Clinton. He is now chairman of the Lincoln Forum, author or co-author of 55 books. He, has he was historical advisor of Steven Spielberg's Lincoln and the recent CNN series Lincoln Divided We Stand. This month he appeared on the new History Channel series Abraham Lincoln. He's hosted 12 previous Civil War events at History Miami Museum. It's amazing. So we welcome Harold and his wife, Edith, once again to Miami on this very special occasion, the 51st wedding anniversary. <laughs> so Harold, you come up and introduce our panel. Thank you so much. Edith was 12 when we were married, it's clear. <laughs> Actually, I, was, I think we were teenagers when we met, but that's another story. Thank you, George, and uh, thanks to Dave uh, Lawrence and the Children's Movement of Florida for, and to Bill and Jean Soman, who will be watching this program when it's online, for your support for these 13 years, and to Hilda and Liana and everyone who helped us get here for this our first trip in two years anywhere, much less back to Florida. But, but um, special and sincere thanks to George, who invited us down here 13 years ago um, and just kept this event going until it grew. Um, and um, you've really been terrific to us. And I just want to say um, how much we appreciate you. So thank you. Well, this is uh, such a timely subject that we're going to explore today because it gets into the complicated story of Native peoples within the context of the most divisive and convulsive moment of American history, the Civil War. Acknowledging, of course, as a foundational um, caveat that European Americans had long been separating indigenous people from their lands and 
I, I throw that out at the beginning because I don't want to keep going back to it, but it's certainly the foundational building block of what, of what animates the rest of our discussion. And I am going to probably use the term Indian and Native American interchangeably. I've gotten permission <laughs> from my colleagues on the panel to be cool about it and just keep going and we can discuss, we can discuss it later. The subject is timely also, and I'm gonna start advancing these slides. Oh, I linger on this one. <laughs> I look younger there. Um, Timely because of the sudden and dramatic response, some might say vandalism against, memorials to Abraham Lincoln to protest his Indian policies, as this statue in San Francisco suggests. It was created by an Armenian sculptor named Haig Petigian in 1926. 94 years later, this is what visitors found when they saw it on December 26, 2020 not coincidentally, the 158th anniversary of the execution of 38 Dakota Sioux in Minnesota, an execution that was authorized by Lincoln after he pardoned 265 others who had been sentenced to death. More on this subject later. And this is a statue by a sculptor named Charles Pope created for the 1939 World's Fair in New York, and then afterwards moved outside the Bennington Art Museum in Vermont, where up to two years ago, it looked like this, meaning it was eroding without much attention being paid. But on Columbus Day, or Indigenous Peoples Day in October 21, it looked like this, with the number 38 scrawled on it to remind people of the 38 executed in Minnesota. Or this statue in Portland. Um, is this Portland? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, this is, yeah. Oh, this is Sioux City, Iowa. I knew it wasn't Portland. Vandalized on July 20th, 20, 2020, complete with a scarf uh, uh, around to, uh, to, with tribal colors. And as you see, the paintings are always red. This is Portland. Uh, the Dakota 38 and the statue brought down in December 2020 on a day called Indigenous Peoples Day of Rage. Whereabouts unknown. Um, it's never been reinstalled. So this is a story that arouses people, to be sure. Uh, the story is complicated. Sometimes it gets violent. And as we see, it evokes an emotional response. So let's start with Lincoln. Let's start with Abraham Lincoln, but not the Abraham Lincoln who's portrayed in that statue. I want to talk for a minute about the future president's grandfather, the first Abraham Lincoln that we know about in history, who moved from Virginia to Kentucky in 1780 to lands on which, no surprise, Native Americans had, had once dwelled and hunted and he volunteered to fight in a militia against Indians. In 1786, an Indian war party attacked Abraham and his three sons, Mordecai, Josiah, and Thomas, as they were planting corn. Abraham Lincoln I was killed at age 42. Young Mordecai ran into the family cabin, seized a rifle, and returned and shot the Indian who was either about to scalp the dead father or kill little Thomas, or both, depending on which story you believe. This is the grave of Lincoln's grandfather. Um, one thing is clear, had the raid gone on, young Thomas, age eight, would not have lived to grow up and father the second Abraham Lincoln, the man who brings us here today. As Lincoln said of his namesake, the man he never knew, the story of his death by Indians and of Uncle Mordecai, then 14 years old, killing one of the Indians, is the legend more strongly than all others imprinted on my mind and memory. As Lincoln remembered it, his father had died not in battle, but in stealth. So that's a powerful comment, and admittedly, imprinted more firmly than any other Lincoln legends in the young boy's 
mind. Now, he wrote that reminiscence when he was 50 years old, so it was still percolating in his mind. That story could not have made Lincoln naturally sympathetic to the plight of dispossessed native peoples. Quite the opposite, which put him in line with most European Americans making their way in the American West. You might say it made him fighting mad, because in 1832, when he was 23 years old, Abe Lincoln left the safety of his village, New Salem, Illinois, and like Abraham Lincoln I, enlisted in the state militia to fight Indians, in this case in the Black Hawk War, organized in response to an unauthorized return to native lands. At age 65, and this is a romanticized image, Chief Black Hawk was leading a multi-tribal band of some 1,000 Sac, Sauk, and Fox Indians from Iowa back into Illinois, determined to reverse a 30-year-old treaty under which they had transferred Illinois land to white settlers. Well, the result was almost predetermined. I mean, we're kind of watching on CNN or the other networks, a, a war unfolding whose conclusion is probably inevitable based on the power and might of one side. Well, this war was kind of predetermined. Um, the native people would lose and Black Hawk, in fact, would go to prison. But first, and this is important in his life, to Lincoln's great surprise, he said, but great satisfaction, he was elected captain of his volunteer company. And he was immensely proud of that. He wrote later in the third person, he has not since had any success in life which gave him so much satisfaction. Um, the war itself was a, a mixed affair. Captain Lincoln, and here again a stylized drawing, enjoyed his soldiers' affection, but not necessarily his superiors' respect. He was actually arrested once for firing his weapon outside camp against orders, and again for letting his 60 men get so drunk that they couldn't march. That's unusual because Lincoln was a teetotaler. And although he endured what he called hardships, he later admitted he was in no battle. He glimpsed corpses but caused no death, saw no action, endured no injury, and never fired that weapon in the field. Some have argued that he enlisted only because he was standing for the Illinois State Legislature that year, his very first run for elective office, and would have stood no chance had he not, had he shirked participating in such a popular, patriotic white man's contest. To his credit, though, he never tried using his service subsequently for political advantage. In fact, he lost the election, maybe because he was so long on campaign, he actually re-enlisted as a private, um, that um, he didn't have time to campaign. Uh, it just wasted an additional three weeks as it happened, although he did win nearly every vote in his hometown. Years later, when Lincoln was serving in Congress, he was able to tease himself about the whole experience. Did you know I am a military hero? He joked from the House floor in 1847. Yes, sir, in the days of the Black Hawk War, I fought, bled, and came away. It is certain I did not break my sword, for I had none to break. But, uh, he, was, he was ridiculing a Democratic politician named Lewis Cass, who was claiming a distinguished military record. Maybe he saw live fighting Indians. It was more than I did. I did have a good many bloody struggles, he said, with the mosquitoes. I think it's fair to say that Indian affairs did not much occupy Lincoln as his political career and horizon expanded. The subject came up during the Lincoln-Douglas debates. I was interested to find myself after forgetting this. Stephen Douglas, his opponent for the Senate in 1858, said at one point that the Declaration of Independence did not apply to, quote, Negroes and savage Indians. And I'd be interested to know what Mr. Lincoln thinks. And Lincoln said that the Declaration of Independence applied to all. Perhaps it's a measure of the sympathies and predilections of white voters in Illinois in 1858 that Douglas prevailed in the election.
When the rebellion came in 1861, I think Lincoln may have underestimated the opportunity to recruit Native people in the war effort. To do so, perhaps he thought, would prematurely have opened the door on the whole idea of recruiting people of color, something he delayed until 1863. Um, the administration had a treaty in place to protect the so-called five civilized tribes in Oklahoma, but it abandoned them to the Confederacy. Now there were enlistments on both sides. This is a kind of extraordinary photograph of native people enlisting in the service one side or the other. I'm reckoning it was Union. Um, some, uh, some native people loyal to the Union went to Kansas, some volunteered. We're not altogether sure, at least I'm not, how they served. Most likely if in units, they were segregated units much like the US colored troops would become, doubtless also as spies and scouts. Eventually, all native units were dispatched back to Indian territory to recapture the lands that the administration had abandoned. There are some characters I want to show you. They may come up again in our panel. This amazing looking man is John Ross, the Cherokee chief said to have owned 200 slaves in the South. As I said, this is complicated. Initially, he allied himself with the Confederacy, but then he met with Lincoln in the White House to say it had all been a mistake. He ultimately went to prison, although Lincoln did agree at Mr. Ross's urging to review some of the agreements on land leases for railroads on native land and he ordered them renegotiated. He didn't give back the land, but he bettered the terms. As the president later reported to Congress, Ross sought a meeting for the purpose of restoring the former relations of his tribe with the United States, insisting that the Union had failed to live up to agreements. One is tempted to say, what else is new? Or how could the North enforce treaties in the rebellious South, which is also a point. In either case, Ross and the Cherokees had formed alliances with the Confederacy as a matter of self-preservation. Now this man, about whom you'll hear more, I'm sure, is William Dole, Lincoln's Commissioner for Indian Affairs, who brought integrity and some degree of sympathy instead of the usual corruption and unmitigated racism to his bureau. Yet by 1864 was compelled under newly passed legislation to force loyal native people who had fled back to Kansas back again to Indian territory. And then in 1862 came the Sioux or Dakota rebellion in Minnesota that I mentioned a minute ago. And I know our panelists will elaborate in various ways on the details, but when soldiers, Union soldiers, crushed the outbreak, General H. H. Silby ordered the execution of 303 <coughs> Indians convicted of, quote, participation in murders and rapes. There was intense political pressure for what white residents called swift justice, especially, and I know you'll imagine the political atmosphere. It was just a few months before a first term president's first off year election. You know what that can be like. Minnesota <coughs> Republicans urged, kind of threatened Lincoln to let the executions go forward if he expected to do well in Minnesota and surrounding areas. Um, Lincoln refused. He demanded all the trial records. He reviewed them, eventually accepting the view of this man Commissioner Dole, that most should be, treated, should be treated as prisoners of war, not murderers. Now this was a difficult time for Lincoln and the Union. This was the time of the Union disaster at the Battle of Fredericksburg. Um, again, the off-year election had just happened and the Republicans did badly. He was consumed with writing his annual message to Congress. This was his most famous one the one where he said, we cannot escape history, in which 
He called, by the way, for removal of African Americans, voluntary colonization, but in a less familiar passage, called for the removal of Indians too. Lincoln emphasized in that message what he called the extreme ferocity of the Minnesota Sioux, who, and I quote, indiscriminately killed men, women, and children. He added, the Indian tribes upon our frontiers have manifested a spirit of insubordination. That's an interesting term. It's kind of a parental term. Um, and in some cases, he said, open hostilities against the white settlements in their vicinity. Though he did call for the Indian system to be remodeled, he also called for removal, a guarantee of, against future hostilities. And yet he did not and would not seek revenge in Minnesota. He was anxious, he said, now this is a convoluted sentence which I think suggests his discomfort with the whole thing. He was anxious to not act with so much clemency as to encourage another outbreak on the one hand, nor with so much severity as to be real cruelty on the other hand. I said it was a complex sentence, so I think he's, he's taking a middle road. In the end, he authorized 39 executions, one more pardon came locally, and on December 26th, the day after Christmas, uh, 38 were hanged. This is a, an image that I always say this about prints. It's not just an illustration. It's a commercially made uh, lithograph from 1862 that was designed for white people to display, I guess, as a warning, as a sign of dominance. But this would have been displayed in taverns and inns and places where people might come and view, not revenge and not clemency, to be sure. Now, on another note, I think it's interesting to say that Lincoln, in a few months from the hanging, presented 19 silver-headed canes to 19 Pueblo leaders to symbolize his recognition of their authority in New Mexico territory. These are kind of fabled relics. And here is a, two great photographs. I'm going to say the names wrong, but I'll do the best I can. This is Tsewa Anye on the left, governor of San Juan Pueblo in 1877, holding his cane, and Mariano Carpintero, the governor of Sandia Pueblo, on the right, holding his Lincoln cane in 1899. And apparently they're still used ceremonious, ceremonially, I was gonna say ceremoniously, and for those of you who are fans of Tony Hillerman uh, novels, he even wrote an entire uh, Joe Leaphorn mystery about the theft of one of those canes. Now, I wanted to relate one meeting that Lincoln had, and it occurred to me as I was rereading the transcripts that we have heard much on those um, television documentaries that George was kind enough to mention, reminded about Lincoln's rather infamous meeting with free black leaders in 1862. Uh, the, uh, the classic good news, bad news meeting, the first time a delegation of black people had ever been invited to the White House, and Lincoln basically told them, I really want you to consider going to Liberia or Central America because you can never be treated equally here, and because of you, we're having this war. It was not his finest moment. A year later, March 1863, he met at the White House, Oh, this is Lincoln in 63. I, I let some of these slides lag. This is a white child identifying one of the Minnesota Indians. Okay, here's the meeting in 1863 in the White House, never recorded by an American artist. This was done by a French lithographer who was putting together an exotic collectible portfolio of portraits of Native Americans who were objects of great fascination in, in England and France at the time. So he meets, he calls together at William Dole's organization, 14 chiefs of the Cheyenne, Kiowa, Arapaho, Comanche, Apache, and Caddo nations, a truly extraordinary gathering, but one at which 
Lincoln spoke equally paternalistically as he had to the African Americans. Now I will say, just to balance, the meeting with the African Americans in the presence of a reporter was meant principally to assure white voters that the forthcoming Emancipation Proclamation did not mean racial integration, did not mean a biracial society. He thought he would have no support for emancipation unless he added colonization to the mix. We can debate whether that was a bridge too far, but this meeting, um, well, we're not sure what, what the point was. But we know that his guests sat cross-legged on the East Room floor. This is not the East Room, I'll explain this picture later. Um, one Washington newspaper said they, the chiefs had the hard and cruel lines in their faces which we might expect in savages. This is the typical white coverage of such an event. But said it soon became clear there were men of intelligence and force of character, cordial in their manner, and they listened intently. Most shook hands with Lincoln individually, and if we can believe the reporter, they each greeted the president by exclaiming, how? Lincoln then told Commissioner Dole, say to them, because he needed translators, I am very glad to see them, and if they have anything to say, it will afford me my great pleasure to hear them. So far, so good. Cheyenne Chief Lean Bear and Arapaho Chief Spotted Bear then spoke through an interpreter. Then it was Lincoln's turn, and it was quite a speech. It actually sounds like it's right out of a John Ford Western. Great white father speaks to red men. Uh, and according to the press again, it was greeted with rounds of applause and exclamations of ugh. I'm just reading what's in the in transcript of the white newspapers. But let me read a little bit of what Lincoln said. You have all spoken of the strange sights you see here. Now, again, he's being somewhat simplistic because he has to go through an interpreter, but I'll let you interpret the rest. Uh, the sights you see here among your pale-faced brethren, the very great number of people that you see, the big wigwams, the difference between our people and your own, but you have seen but a very small part of the pale-faced people. You may wonder when I tell you there are people here in this wigwam now looking at you who have come from other countries a great deal farther off than you've come. We pale-faced people think that this world is a great round ball. And then he asked for them to bring, for his aides to bring a globe to the center of the meeting so he could show his visitors the great round ball that he was speaking of. Um, Lincoln said, we have people now present from all parts of this globe, here and here, I assume he's pointing, and here. There is a great difference between this pale-faced people and their red brethren, both as to numbers and the way in which we live. Now, he then, he gave his only policy advice of his discourse, and that was, the pale-faced people are numerous and prosperous because they cultivate the earth. They produce bread. They depend upon the products of the earth rather than wild game for subsistence. You've asked for my advice, says Lincoln. I really am not capable of advising you whether in the providence of the great spirit, who is the great father of us all, it is best for you to adopt a new mode of life. I can only say I see no way for your race to become numerous and prosperous as the white race, this is very biblical by the way, uh, by living as, as they do by the cultivation of the earth. So he was asking his visitors to become farmers and not hunters. And then he adds, you know it is not always possible for any father to have his children do precisely as he wishes them to do. So what can we say? Earnest? I think so. Condescending? Not Lincoln's finest moment. Also not particularly surprising coming from a mid-19th century American president. And in one respect, breathtakingly and ironically unobservant, because he said at one point, um, we are now engaged in a great war between one another. But then a few beats later, he actually said, we are not as a race so much disposed to fight and kill one another as our red brethren. <laughs>
Hello? <laughs> there were four or 500,000 people dead by this point. Black recruitment had not yet begun. Um, so this is just white people killing, white brethren killing one another. So a little bit unconscious. When the meeting adjourned, the delegation went to the White House Conservatory. That's where this picture was made. I think that's Dole to the top left with the visitors. And then as you see, it became a little bit of a, an occasion as others joined. That is not Lincoln on the left. We're not sure who it is. And that's not Mary Lincoln in the top right, uh, although it's, she's been mistaken for Mary Lincoln. But right in the center of this picture in the top row is Lincoln's chief of staff, John G. Nicolay, who would soon be going west himself and maybe wanted to get in on the act. By the way, all four of the chiefs in the front row would be dead within a year in battle. And that brings us in December 1864 to just a month after Lincoln's reelection to the horror of the Sand Creek Massacre, a murderous rampage led by Union Colonel John Chivington and his Colorado militia after white settlers in search of gold had trespassed on Cheyenne and Arapaho land and a hundred of the whites had been killed. But a hundred killed in return, including men and women who were native people who were sexually mutilated. And this native drawing um, comes, give, tells you that gruesome story. Among the victims were Lean Bear, who had met with Lincoln, and Black Kettle, who had met with Lincoln, who had to carry away his wife, medicine woman later, after she had been shot in the Sand Creek Massacre nine times. Lincoln wanted reforms, but the war absorbed him. And only a week after the surrender of Robert E. Lee at Appomattox, he himself was dead, one of the war's last casualties. One of the men in this scene, I'm trying to find him. I have to look at the bigger picture. Well, he's there, I promise is Eli Parker, who was a member of Ulysses S. Grant's staff. Um, ap after Lee surrendered, he shook hands all around with Grant's, um, Grant's staff members. I don't know if he got to Lincoln's son, Robert, who was right outside the door. But he did shake hands with the people in this room. And then he, he sort of came face to face with Eli Parker, and he kind of stopped abruptly because he was looking at a man of color. And then Lee realized that this was not an African American, but a Native American. And he said, bitterly, Lee said, well, I see at least there's one American here, one genuine American in this room. And Eli Parker, without skipping a beat, looked at him and said, today, General, we're all Americans. Whether that applied to white, black, and indigenous people will be the subject of today's discussion. But I hope some of these, um, some of these observations will be helpful in setting the stage. And as I've said from the beginning, when I've described this as a complicated story, here is a 20th century photograph of Native American Confederate veterans still celebrating their war against the war against slavery. Very complicated. Um, we make treaties with you when we try to observe them, the self-appointed great white father told his visitors in 1863. And if our children should sometimes behave badly and violate those treaties, it is against our wish. That may sum up Lincoln's attitude. He would. Uh, he would ultimately approve 19 treaties with Indian nations, including land cession treaties with the Chippewa, the Utah, and the Fox and the Sauk, the same tribes that he had once opposed in the Black Hawk War 30 years earlier. But he also built forts and new telegraph lines through Indian territory, um, the railroad, the Transcontinental Railroad, which, in which, for which the federal government exerted right-of-way privileges. 
and one of his signal domestic achievements, the Homestead Act, arguably displaced or made permanent the displacement of indigenous people. Um, was he friendly to native people? Certainly not by our standards. Did he believe uh, rights existed? I would say yes. Did he ultimately believe native people had to reimagine their traditions and their culture? Yes, and to embrace Christianity and reject previous uh, religious beliefs? I would say yes. Um, he mentioned Indian affairs in another message to Congress in 1863. Sound policy and our imperative duty to these wards of the government demand our anxious and constant attention to their material well-being, to their progress in the arts of civilization, and above all, to that moral healing which under the blessing of divine providence will confer upon them the elevated and sanctifying influences, the hopes and consolations of the Christian faith. That's Abraham Lincoln, the missionary. But for a veteran of an Indian war, though he never pulled a trigger, as the grandson of a pioneer, a white pioneer, killed by Indians, my suggestion is that notwithstanding the legitimate grievances of generations of native people, Lincoln, as always in his career, came a considerable way. So how should we remember him as the partner of 265 native people or as the executioner of 38? And when it came to that globe that people of all races shared and which he described as a great round ball, um, should we take him at his word that his goal was to live in peace with you, all our red brethren? What makes us cringe today may have pleased his visitors behind, beyond words and may even have struck some white readers of that speech as a little too progressive. So it's hard to do a simple, simplistic uh, um, discussion of this era. And I think I regret the simplistic defacement of Abraham Lincoln um, in all cases. Sometimes we have built monuments too blindly, such as in this 1909 statue of a Colorado cavalryman, which for a century and a half, well, for a century, stood in front of the state capitol building in Denver. Now, this is a tribute to the same regiment that participated in the Sand Creek Massacre. Unfeeling, rewriting history, I would argue so. In October 2020, it was brought down. It's now in the History Colorado Museum. George, they spell it the same way as one word with a capital and then History Colorado, as an artifact, not an icon. And this base outside of the state capitol awaits a statue remembering the massacre. Um, sometimes I think it's easier to pull down statues than to decide what we can rally around and build. And maybe we can talk about some of that today. It's said that just before the war ended, Lincoln said, if we get through the war and I live, the Indian system will be reformed. But he didn't live, and we will never know. Thank you. Thank you. And now if I can invite the panelists to take their seats. Come up together and I will introduce you once you're all seated. We have a uh, wonderful, distinguished group of panelists today. I'm honored to introduce them. Um, at your right is Caroline Laporte, an attorney who serves as a judicial advisor to the Seminole trial, Tribe of Florida and an associate judge for the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians. 
Caroline lectures widely on Native Americans and on indigenous cultures. She is a descendant of the Little River Band, and she also works as a director of the Tribal Safe Housing Center for the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center, and on the American Bar Association's Victims' Rights Task Force. And she teaches indigenous studies at the University of Miami. When Caroline signed on, she said she has four jobs, but I think she undercounted. <laughs> Welcome, Caroline Laporte. <laughs> We're also excited to welcome Dr. Elena Roberts, who is Assistant Professor of History at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, like Frank Williams and me, she's come in from the cold to visit Miami. Uh, she is a historian who specializes in the intersection of black and Native American life in the Civil War era she's, and beyond. She's focused her studies and her writing and her research and her teaching on several cultures, including black and native history in the West. She is the author of I've Been Here All the While, Black Freedom on Native Land. And just a couple of weeks ago, um, she was named a finalist for the 2022 Lincoln Prize for that book. So congratulations and welcome. <laughs> I think I've introduced Frank Williams more than any other person <laughs> on earth, and he me, probably. Um, like, like me, Frank has appeared at all 13 History Miami Civil War Symposia, and as those of you who have come over the years, uh, he, you know he is the retired Chief Justice of the Rhode Island Supreme Court, the co-founder and Chairman Emeritus of the Lincoln Forum, the former chairman of the Abraham Lincoln Association and the outgoing chair, but the longtime chair of the Ulysses S. Grant Association, author of more than a dozen Lincoln books, an acclaimed speaker, talk about having four plus jobs, right? Um, and one of the best known Lincoln collectors of his time, the, uh, the product of which, the result of 60 plus years of collecting, probably more than that, right? Probably since you were you're very young, maybe, let's say, 65 plus, as we all say now. Um, the product of that intensive collecting, he and his wife donated a couple of years ago to Mississippi State University, which now displays it in a beautiful gallery named in their honor. So welcome back, Chief. <laughs> So I think what we decided beforehand when we did the rules and regulations is that we're going to invite each of our panelists to do an opening statement and then I'll have some questions. So let's start with Caroline Laporte. Thank you for having me. Um, Busu Ani Caroline Laporte. Um, as Harold stated, I am an Anishinaabe woman, uh, an immediate descendant of the Little River Band of uh, Ottawa Indians. Uh, my family's ancestral land is what is now known as Michigan. Um, <laughs> I am an attorney. Uh, don't hold that against me, please. Um, unlike the other panelists, I'm probably the only really non-Civil War expert here. Um, my subject matter expertise is squarely situated within the experience of Native American women who are sexual assault and domestic violence survivors, which I believe actually has a very strong through line uh, to the content that we're discussing today. Um, so I often talk to my students at the University of Miami about the different eras of federal Indian law and policy uh, that spans the arc of settler colonialism and its violent relationship, if you can call it that, uh, with its indigenous populations. The two eras that I think most overlap uh, with our discussion for today uh, are first, removal of native people, and second, the allotment and assimilation era, uh, which we talked about a little bit um, earlier with your mention of uh, massive land theft. I would be remiss if I did not point out that at all times, the United States, whether unified as one or split into two, has been a colonizing government uh, whose chief occupation has been one of genocide and massive land theft. It is my understanding that our panel today is going to explore various politics during the Civil War, quote unquote, conflict and removal of native people, 
uh, from their lands. But one thing that I really wanted to highlight today and address, because I do believe that it's very relevant to what is going on present day uh, discourse in Canada, and most certainly will be going on here when Deb Holland completes her review of Indian boarding schools, <laughs> is that during the height of the Civil War and the Reconstruction era and the decade thereafter, America remained steadfast in search of a solution to its Indian problem, or the so-called Indian question. As it became prohibitively more expensive to kill my ancestors, the United States government pushed another genocidal campaign, one of absolutely violent forced assimilation. In 1819, Congress passed the Indian Civilization Fund Act. Uh, its chief purpose was to civilize native people the business of making Indians white was no less than an ongoing act of state violence. It was aimed at the eradication and extermination of our people, and at the very least of our people as indigenous people. So I wanted to talk about Brigadier General Richard Pratt, who's my least favorite person in US history. <laughs> he was shaped uh, primarily by his military life. In 1861, he enlisted as a volunteer uh, in a volunteer regiment during the Civil War, and in 1867, uh, post his time there, he was assigned to Fort Gibson in Indian Territory. But in 1875, Pratt transported captured Native uh, prisoners of war from Fort Sill to Fort Marion here in St. Augustine, Florida. It is here that he began a massive social experiment to assimilate both the prisoners of war that he had taken and also their children. He was apparently very successful in the eyes of the U.S. government. He lobbied Congress uh, and was able uh, to convince both the War Department and the Department of the Interior to open the Carlisle Indian School in 1879. How many of you are aware of this history already? I'm just curious. Okay, so some. All right, good. So this is topical and not redundant then. Great. Um, as such, a new genocidal tactic is born as children of influential tribal leaders uh, were stolen, often by Bureau of Indian Affairs agents, and taken to state or church-run st and state-funded programs across the United States. Uh, Pratt's famous motto at this time was to kill the Indian, save the man. He believed that he was planting treason to the tribe and, lo and supplanting loyalty to the nation at large, and this is how he sold his program to both Congress uh, and, to, and to white society at large. To call these institutions schools is a <laughs> dramatic and very odd retelling. Um, they were internment camps. Um, the children of these nations were taken uh, forcibly from their homes, they were stripped from their families, they were taken from their tribal communities, oftentimes very far away from their reservations or where they were living. They were punished for their indigeneity, uh, not allowed to speak their language, their hair was cut, their names were taken from them, and they were forced to practice Christianity. And even though all of that very much resembles, at the very least, cultural genocide, physical genocide occurred as well. Um, Native children in these schools were murdered, they were sexually assaulted, they were physically abused, uh, they were kept separate from their siblings. Um, and, and there are a ton of other horrific stories, but I believe if everyone's been watching the news, I assume you've seen uh, some of the information that's come from Canada recently, uh, in which they uh, started with the discovery at uh, Clam Loops Indian School found a mass grave of 215 indigenous children. It's difficult to talk about in a way for myself just because of my own family's history with Indian boarding school, so you have to excuse me if I get a little off, uh, off my notes here. But more than, uh, than 10,000 Native children passed through Carlisle, which was just the first school that he started, and 180 of them lie in unmarked graves in a cemetery. Uh, over the course of the United States policy, they opened up over 367 schools. 73 of them remain open, uh, and 15 of them are still boarding. Uh, those schools today are not operated by the U.S. government. Um, they're, they're normally either like taken over by the tribal government, for example, and repurposed in a way. But my grandfather, a World War II veteran who fought in the 45th Infantry with the famed Thunderbird Division, which helped to liberate Dachau, uh, was a survivor of this genocide, uh, as was his mother and her aunties and their mothers. So I am here today as an inheritor of that harm. Um, of Carlisle, 
of the Genoa Industrial School of Nebraska, of Mount Pleasant in Michigan, and of Holy Childhood in Harbor Springs. My grandfather's school did not close until 1983, which was just two years prior to my birth. So when we talk about all of this today, I do ask that you would remember these legacies as well. Thank you. Caroline, thank you for sharing the history and the emotion behind it. Uh, Professor Roberts. Hello, everyone. Um, so my specialty is not in necessarily the middle, uh, military battles um, or even <laughs> politics all the time um, of this era, really. My work is looking at the Native people and Black people who lived in what is now Oklahoma what was once called Indian Territory. And so I wanted to start by giving you a background um, really to why Native Americans actually owned black slaves. And so Harold mentioned this a bit in his opening intro. Um, but my ancestry on my father's side um, is African American, as well as people of African descent who were owned by Chickasaw and Choctaw Indians. Um, I also have Chickasaw and Choctaw ancestry. Um, but there were five tribes originally from the southeast, uh, so Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, um, who basically owned slaves in the same manner as white Americans. And so to take you kind of back to how we even get the institution of slavery in these nations, I wanted to tell you a little about uh, the systems of slavery and captivity that were actually present in North America before Europeans. Um, so if you've seen the film Gladiator, if you're at all really kind of familiar with uh, some of Roman history, then you know that as the Romans were conquering, they came into conflict with many different groups of people. And when those people lost, they were killed. Um, many of the men were killed, but then there were also women and children who were taken captive. And so this is actually what happened in North America as well. There were lots and lots of different uh, diverse groups of Native Americans throughout North America. Um, and they fought over resources, they fought over land, they fought because they didn't like each other for some reason. Um, and when they took over, they took not just the resources, but also the physical resources, the people, to really kind of add to their number, excuse me, add to their numbers, as well as to uh, replace dead loved ones. Uh, this labor was needed, but also it was important to maintaining social ties. And so many of these people already had uh, a really kind of varied ethnic background, we should say. But none of this captivity was about race. There was no idea of race. And so when Euro-Americans came um, to the continent, they really introduced this idea of race because it was helpful and useful for a system of labor. And so if you know anything about the uh, colonial period, then you know that Spain is here, France is here, all these various um, empires are trying to make claims in North America. Um, and so really when we look at different labor systems that are present throughout North America, um, such as Native American slavery, that preceded African shadow slavery and entered servitude, there were really lots of different ways that labor could have actually gone in what became the United States. But African shadow slavery was chosen because people of African descent could be made to basically be seen as inferior. And so when we think of the idea of race, that African Americans are all descended from one group of people, it's a creation that really kind of distills all of the complexity of the various people from Africa um, who really kind of came together to create what we now think of as black. And so um, Carolyn mentioned assimilation, the uh, desire to supposedly civilize Native Americans. Um, and so during the 700s, 1700s, there were various policies, uh, often today called the civilization policy. And so people were looking to pressure Native Americans to change, um, to change their clothing, to learn English, to go to American schools, to dress like Europeans and Americans, and so there were many ways that this was not as coercive as it would become in the 1800s. Um, and this was kind of more suggestions, talks. Um, you could receive uh, help from the US government to actually pay for things like spinning wheels. Um, all of these ideas that we have about uh, what makes a group civilized were part of these um, talks with native people to try to get them to um, assimilate. 
And the five tribes that I look at, the Cherokee, Choctaw, Seminole, Creek, and Chickasaw nations, they were interested in slavery because at this time slavery was considered civilized. Um, so Americans were very happy that they would take on this system that really centers around private property, capitalism, the pursuit of wealth, uh, which is not really something that was evident in the five tribes um, before Europeans. And so because of really their desire to become part of the slave system, but also uh, the fact that they created a tripartite government. So all of these tribes today still have a judicial, legislative, and executive branch, just like the United States. Uh, a lot of the elites sent their children to American schools to become educated. And so these were people who then came back and told their families about uh, the legal education that they had. Um, this allowed them to create better treaties with the United States. And so we get a sense that these five Indian nations, partially because of slavery, but also because of all these other changes that they were willing to make in their societies, uh, became known as the five civilized tribes because they were seen as different um, and better than a lot of native people in the farther west who were looked at as just warriors who were interested um, in military battles and weren't actually as receptive to um, Euro-American culture. And so some of these differences between the five tribes and other Indian people are why we eventually have um, really the differences and the distinctions um, of their battle and of their kind of political thought about the Civil War. Um, but I'll get into that in some of the Q&A. Okay. Thank you. Frank. This is really uh, the story when it relates to Abraham Lincoln and our own American culture, a story of the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, mostly the ugly. Uh, as many of you know, I come from Rhode Island. Uh, our founder, Roger Williams, no relation, <laughs> no relation, uh, was on very good terms with the Narragansetts. That was our tribe. And, um, and actually did a dictionary between English and the Narragansett language and was and fairly treated uh, in trading post and elsewhere uh, the, the, those Native Americans that occupied what became the state, the state of Rhode Island. Untrue with uh, later leaders that came from Europe uh, and uh, not true uh, regarding our president, Abraham Lincoln. In fact, um, I, I don't like to quote, but this is from Phil Paladin, who had a superb study of Lincoln's presidency. Lincoln may not have had any special animus toward Indians, but he shared the widespread conviction that they lacked civilization and constituted an obstacle to the economic development of the West. And Professor Eric Foner, who is living and still very, very uh, productive, has pointed out and called Lincoln's policies depressingly similar to those of virtually every 19th century president. Not good. We didn't know what to do with Native Americans uh, when, as Caroline said, uh, we took their land. Lincoln wanted uh, them to assimilate, as uh, um, Leona says, and uh, become in agriculture, uh, not ride the plains to hunt, uh, and so on. But um, I must say, in conclusion, and we've got a ways to go, that, uh, and I'm reading from Michael Green's very good monograph, uh, Lincoln and the Native Americans in the Concise Lincoln series from Southern Illinois University Press. He closes this with this sentence. He was better than many of his contemporaries and presidential predecessors and successors, but not what his admirers or those who wanted better lives for Native Americans would have liked him to be. And I think that pretty much sums it up uh, despite his, his not having the chance to reform Indian policy. He inherited a lot of this.
and including the corrupt agents uh, of uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and yet he was not able to change that culture. Call it what you will, civil war, precedents, and so on, but we uh, are found, we have failed, I think, in Native American policy then, as well as now, uh, and still need to have some way out or a path in which to justify and help uh, Native Americans today. So this, this is a, um, instructive about the, the events leading up to the Civil War, and also we've heard a bit about the unchanging prejudices and animus and the challenges since the Civil War. So we're going to focus a little bit back on wartime. Um, oh, I'm supposed to show these wonderful pictures. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, let me ask, a point's been made that the, um, that the Indian tribes were on the, quote, the wrong side of many early American conflicts, basically with the French in the French and Indian Wars, with the, with, mainly with the British in the American Revolution and the War of 1812. How did this impact on their plans and their loyalties when America split in two? What, what was the political motivation? Or was it strictly regional, strictly tribal? How did it all pan out? Elena, maybe you could start. Uh, well, I, I, I'm you know, thinking of on the wrong side, of course, with, you know, um, scare quotes uh, because the idea that you know Native Americans alliances are the the same as the United States or Britain or anything there are all of these different motivations that various Native people have um, so my nation the Chickasaw Nation actually did fight with the with the United States uh, in the War of 1812 but they did so because they saw the United States as their best partner who had given them great trading goods who had really kind of thought of them as a more independent nation versus the British. But uh, with a lot of the colonial period, for a long time, a lot of Indian nations, especially in the East, were looking at Britain um, as really kind of the safe holder of their treaties. Uh, it was Britain who was really telling the colonists, you can't move out further um, you know, than this line, this arbitrary line to the colonists. And so this, I think, is the a really important way of looking at the American Revolution and those sorts of motivations and really what white American settlers are looking for from the very beginning. Um, so this shapes the alliances during this early colonial period as well as later on. And so looking at slavery as an important motivator of the Civil War, but also land for Native people and whichever side they feel is going to help them maintain their land holdings. I mean, I have to co-sign that entirely. I think the way that you have, we have to look at it, right, is what exactly were the Native Americans or the American Indians, Alaska Natives here up against? And it's another war outside of the Civil War. It's, and it's been ongoing since, since contact, right? So it's, it's about sort of thinking around, like you said, the treaty aspect of it. The U.S. entered into over 440 treaties with, with Native American tribes, and none of them have been upheld. In fact, the most recent one that I think was upheld in any sort of significance was out of Oklahoma with the McGirt case. Um, but that's it, right? So you, you've, got, you've got tribes, you have tribal leaders who are abutting against, uh, again, against genocide, and they're making compromises based on what they think their strength of position is. Um, have any of you ever tried to negotiate a contract? Have you ever tried to do it in a language you do not speak? Right? That's another consideration of what Native tribes are doing at the time. Um, we get to the Dakota 38, that becomes relevant as well. But um, there's, just, I, there's a lot involved here, um, more specifically around survival than anything else, I think. Frank, do you want to wait? I think uh, the, the allies or the alliances that you talk about, Harold, 
really had to do with what is better for the Native Americans, where they would think that they would be better treated, uh, with the Brits or with the Confederacy. Uh, Jefferson Davis, the President of the Confederate States of America, Lincoln called it so-called, he never recognized it as a nation, uh, was um, more effective in dealing with tribes than Abraham Lincoln and his administration. I think, too, that um, what we had was, despite the language barrier, Caroline, in negotiating contracts, was the corruptness of federal officials yeah. in um, complying with the treaties. And as Caroline also indicated, I think correctly, uh, wound up being the theft of of lands that, that properly belong to them. Let, let's talk about Jefferson Davis for a minute. Frank, you mentioned him, and he did have, I mean, Lincoln had lore and tradition and family mythology in his background, but not much experience with, with Native people. Davis um, actually negotiated treaties when he was Secretary of War, right? Correct under Franklin, uh, President Pierce. Right. Franklin Pierce. Although I, I learned that one of the, his negotiators, a man named Albert Pike, recently had his statue removed. So there must have been some treaty uh, misconduct that I'm not aware of. Do you think Davis just had more, just more experience than Lincoln and that accounts for his perhaps having a, the upper hand in the South in I, I think so. creating alliances? I think so. And I believe it or not, uh, he was a man of great honor, or at least he had the precepts of what honor meant, and that included uh, honoring treaties uh, that were uh, negotiated with, with the tribes. Frank, before we, before we move on, tell the story, because I don't want to tell every story, but there were, there were several experiences Lincoln had in the Black Hawk War of 1832-33 that I didn't dwell on. And one of the most famous um, was when an elderly Native person wandered into the camp that Lincoln was uh, occupying at that time. You've told the story before. I'm well, I think hand I it to you. I think that goes to Lincoln's empathy. Uh, this was an older um, Native American who was in the, the lines of the, of the uh, militia. And Lincoln's men uh, wanted to kill him. Uh, and this was already out of the combat zone, so-called. And Lincoln stepped in and prevented that from happening because uh, he believed that that was the wrong thing to do and that the Native American had a pass to, to travel freely. So you would think that because his grandfather had been uh, taken by a Native American, uh, Lincoln would not be so sympathetic. I think we see it again, too, in the Dakota, in the Dakota case on the commutation of, of so many uh, Native Americans. Right. Yeah, so he, he literally stepped in, right? He imposed his six foot four frame on the people, the soldiers who were probably drinking a little bit and thought, we haven't seen any action, we haven't killed anyone. Here's an old man who's, you know, probably was 50 years old, and that was old for 20 year old <laughs> kids, but wandered into camp. If we string him up or shoot him, we can say that we have, um, We've accomplished something, and his unit had seen um, examples as they marched of atrocities, both atrocities that white soldiers had committed on Native people and atrocities that Native warriors had, con had committed on, on, on white soldiers. So they were revved up to do something. And I don't know, I think there's a little bit of the kind of loyally sense of fairness that he also had. He was, he did not believe in 
immediate action without weighing the case. And in this case, an innocent person, right? Yes, and remember, uh, Lincoln, with the assistance of an adjutant general, an assistant adjutant general under uh, Holt, Joseph Holt, examined every one of those records, so-called, of those condemned uh, to be executed in the um, Indiana uprising, so-called, or the Dakota um, uprising in Minnesota in 1862. Anyone else want to comment on, I guess we're at the Dakota Uprising now, which is clearly the symbolic um, event for pro protesters now. By the way, I, I've spoken twice at the Minnesota Historical Society in St. Paul, and both times um, I was shouted down. The first time it happened, I didn't know what was going on because I was not schooled enough in this, uh, you know, as a, a a white historian, I grew up with the story that Abraham Lincoln pardoned um, 260 something um, Native people. Not that, so it's great, and it is both the greatest, the biggest mass pardoning in federal judicial history and the, the biggest mass execution in federal judicial So it's a half empty, half full, and I, with Lincoln, I tend and tended to take the half full. But tell us your perspective on the Dakota uprising and, and the review. This is the big case that everyone speaks about now. Yeah, I think so. From my perspective, the Dakota uprising has to be considered, you, you first have to consider your framing, right? So what's going on at this time? Um, <laughs> there are people uh, living in, in this region, right, who, are living on native land and then there are native people who are supposed to be receiving um, monetary payment for survival uh, and, and Indian agents are intercepting the money they're not getting it right uh, and so they're starving the native people are starving um, and I believe it was two Indian boys right who stole uh, something some eggs right eggs, exactly. they stole some eggs um, and ended up killing, I think, five settlers in the process. Um, and this launches, right, um, a, a need to respond uh, from the settler's perspective. I think there was even a local store owner who has this uh, famous saying, if they were hungry, let them eat grass. Um, and, and when you're starving, right, what are, what are you going to do? Um, and I, I think that that's what has to be considered in all this. So there's, there's that aspect of it, but then when it, when they finally get to the trial, right, I even think on the last day, and it's, they're tried by a military commission, they, they push through 40, 40 cases on that last day. There's no due process involved in that. Um, it's, you're, you're being tried by a foreign tribunal. You're not, it's not in your language. Uh, you're not represented. You don't, and, and you're not provided the ability to um, bring your own witnesses. I mean, all the things that you would expect, right, from any sort of judicial proceeding centered on fairness, uh, these Native American individuals were not getting. Um, and so that's mostly my perspective on it, I think. But you, I think you have to think about the historical, like what actually led to this situation, right, is that there's just ongoing settler violence in the space and, and abrogation of treaty rights and non-payment for things, which leads to starvation, which, which beget the need to get food elsewise. Um, and then that beget more violence. And uh, Frank, comment on this, I think it's kind of obvious but it hasn't been in the history that we've read or, or I've read. And that is even not going back two steps, which is provocation or justification, but just going back to the trials. Frank, you've presided over a few trials. So, Was this a fair trial? So, no, it wasn't by our standards. And, and Caroline's right, there was really no due process. But, and this is no defense of Lincoln's administration and uh, General Pope, who headed the, mm -hmm. the army uh, in the area. Um, th but a couple of things we should know. The, the Dakotas were confined to a two-mile strip um, in, in Minnesota, and not enough, not enough uh, area to fish or hunt or, or exist. And in addition to the money payments that Caroline mentioned, they were supposed to get provisions. Yeah. That is to 
survive and eat and have foodstuffs, and that didn't come. And that's what provoked the attacks. Now, having done so, uh, the, the uprising caused about, it's hard to know the exact numbers, between 200 and 600 uh, white settlers were, were uh, killed. Uh, over 100 soldiers were killed, uh, militia mostly. Uh, I don't know what a quantity of Native Americans. And of course, the cause which was understandable, um, and we're looking at it from uh, whether the glass is half full or half empty. And um, the, if, if you know that Lincoln showed great empathy in commuting so many lives, so many Native Americans, but if you go to the Dakota land in Minnesota, you see a monument and it's got Abraham Lincoln, murderer. And that's how they viewed uh, the administration because of the deaths uh, e of even 38 people. Uh, as Harold said, there was 39, but there was one commuted. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but, but here's the thing that's troubling. Um, John Witt, who wrote recently a book on, from Yale, who wrote a book on the Lieber Code, which did not come out until um, June of 63, eight months after the Dakota Uprising. Uh, he raised the issue of, my God, the question that we should ask is, why were we even having military tribunals mm -hmm. yeah. for, the, uh, for, the, for the Dakota? Uh, and I think uh, that's, that's a question. Now, the Lincoln's, Lincoln, who was commander-in-chief under our Uniform Code of Military Justice, then under the Lieber Code, of June 1863, and even now under the Uniform Code of Military Justice that was adopted as amended in President Truman's administration in the early 50s, uh, the Commander-in-Chief, that is the President, gets the right to review all of the courts, uh, all of the courts martial that we have, whether Native American or uh, a GI or a Marine in the armed forces. And what Lincoln did as the commander-in-chief, and he did review courts martial of, of uh, northern soldiers and sailors, um, was order all of the records, so-called, such as they were, not complete records. We do things differently today than then. And um, sat down with this aide and determined who were really found guilty uh, from the evidence, at least alleged evidence, of rapes uh, and massacre. That's a term that was used to determine the guilt or innocence. And those, those um, became part of the 38, the Dakota 38, so-called. The rest were commuted uh, because uh, the sense of the commander-in-chief that they should not be put to death. So um, we have a conundrum here, and also, again, the ambiguity over race and nationhood, uh, and, and the Indian tribes were not even uh, relegated to the status of a nation. In fact, in 1871, there was a congressional act to say that Indian tribes were not uh, nations. And, and, and the, thing, um, the thing that bothers me as a judge is um, two things. One is they didn't even, Native Americans didn't even become citizens of the United States till 1926 yeah. or 27, right? Uh, that's number one. Number two, we, we always, we always, we 
it, it, not so much now in our culture, our present culture, is we argue against judging the past through the wrong end of a telescope. Now, we're not, we're not um, limited to judging the past uh, through uh, the wrong end of a telescope, especially when it comes to Native Americans. I, I think we see a problem over our own civilization as to how we behave and had behaved, not just to African Americans, but to um, the Indian tribes. Elena, will you weigh in on this, uh, on the Dakota? Um, a lot of what I, I think um, I've seen in the kind of evolving ideas of the trial really, I think I could answer that by talking about what I kind of introduce my students to in like my classes. Um, many people who have never thought about Native American history, um, I talk about language and what it means, for example, that we call the American Revolution, revolution rather than rebellion. <laughs> it's because Americans were successful and it's because we're Americans. And so we think that it was a really great event. Um, and a couple of times I've actually had British students in my class and I always ask them, you know, what does it say in your textbooks about the American Revolution? Um, and she says, sometimes they say, oh, it's barely taught. Um, and other times she says, of course, it's, it's not the celebratory narrative that we ourselves know. And so when we think of Native Americans and Native history, I think we always have to remember that the way they think about events is differently. Their motivations are different. Um, and that if we think of things more as it's almost a constant war for them in this period of time, that if we want to say their actions were in fact what was recorded, then what is the context for them, not for us looking at American settlement as something that is great because it's not great for them. Um, and their communal ownership of land, their culture, all of these things are really sort of disintegrating for Western peoples who are having their lands really trespass in a totally unprecedented way. I think all that said, and this has been a really interesting exploration, um, I think we also should keep in mind the political pressure. Lincoln is very far away from Minnesota and he's told that he's facing open rebellion from his white constituents, who are mostly Republican. This is a Republican state. So he's really, in, I mean, we're talking about human lives, but there's also hard politics involved in, in the Northwest, where Lincoln is responsible as the leader of his party for establishing a foothold in a state. And he's told that even with mass commutation, he's going to be held politically accountable for being a softy. Uh, and that's, it, it was very tough, I think, for him. And he did, he, he wrote each name down. He wrote 300 names in, like, you, transliteration. You, know, you, you and I have dealt with, we know Ralph, the late Ralph Newman, who was a great Civil War collector and salesperson in Chicago. But we were at his house um, in the John Hancock Tower, his condominium, and uh, I think you were there. Okay. <laughs> and we actually saw the document oh, yeah. of commutation with Lincoln writing the names phonetically of every yeah. Native American that was um, of the, 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 the 265. And uh, he was holding it for a buyer who bought it from him or through him. But it was, uh, it was awe-inspiring to just see the president as commander-in-chief commuting these 265. I, I, the, it was a traumatic occasion for me because I was so spooked by being in the Hancock Tower that I was, stood in the center of the room. And when Ralph said, would you like to see this? I said, pass it over here, and he wouldn't. So it's not my favorite buildings. I don't like really tall. Well, Harold, and you bring up political pressures for Lincoln. I mean, one of the reasons I think a lot of my students have always thought well of Lincoln is because he's willing to kind of make the unpopular stand mm -hmm. when it comes to, let's say, African Americans and um, fighting in the military and some of his eventual changes about the way he thinks about black people. 
but he's not willing to take that difficult stand with Native people. No. No. No, he didn't. Uh, and and you, we can offer all kinds of excuses, Elena and uh, Caroline, but it, they, he never got to grasp and deal with reforming uh, policy, federal government policy, for uh, Native Americans. By the way, ultimately, you know, Lincoln pardoned um, 39, uh, I'm sorry, 37, and then one person, well, how did it go? It was 39, then it became 38. But there was a 39th person who was actually tracked down in Canada and extradited. I think it might not have happened until after Lincoln was dead, but there was a 39th person who was executed after the mass execution. I mean, by the way, just to talk about the culture, and, you know, Elena's right, we, we have to look at this through the, an, an additional lens, which is that Lincoln had some evolutionary growth regarding African Americans that he did not have with Native people. The mass execution was a huge public spectacle slash celebration in Mankato. It was witnessed by men, white men, women, and children as a, you know, an exotic day. And um, you know, the trap door was cut and 38 people were left there for an hour. Um, I, I you know, think it was a, it's this brutal part of the American experience uh, that also, goes, carries into the lynching era. Yeah, also, um, the pressure that he was under by uh, officials in uh, Minnesota uh, was so great that, that um, Lincoln would say, and I think you pointed this out in your, your comments at the beginning, I am not going to kill people for votes. Right. I don't think I did the quote, but yes. And, and um, I think that shows about his character. Unfortunately, and this is an excuse, uh, he didn't have the time, I think, in the second, in his second administration to tackle not just Reconstruction, but a reform of the, right. uh, of the Native American policy. Well, he didn't have the spare time in his first administration because he was consumed by war and emancipation policy. He didn't have more than six weeks as president in the second term. This is all... Um, you know, worth re-exploring as, as, as we've been doing. Can I, can I add? So, you know, one thing that, so I do a lot of federal policy work, actually. It's my primary job, unfortunately. And um, I know, you, I just, Congress was so fun the last six years. Um, so what, it's, it's hard for me as, a, as an indigenous person, right, to imagine a federal policy that is actually meaningful for native people simply by the virtue that this is an occupation that has been ongoing and so it's it's hard i think it's difficult too because and, and I, i'm again i'm somebody that works on federal legislation um i struggle a lot with some of the short-sightedness of even the work that i do right if what i want ultimately as an indigenous person is indigenous governance and indigenous futures to be a reality not just for myself but for everybody for everybody in this room for everybody in the country um, what does it mean that I partake in these, in these systems that are by their nature very colonial? Everything that is indigenous is antithetical to a settler worldview. And the US government is a colonizing nation, period. I mean, I, and I don't know, I mean, maybe you might not agree with me. I feel like I'm speaking for all native people right now up here, but um, it's hard. Like that can be a difficult reality of what is our, sh what is, what is our shared can we acknowledge our shared past together? Can we have truth and healing around that? And then what does our shared future look like with one another? That's actually a really big question that I don't think has been resolved. And you can look to Hawaii as a really great modern example of this. Well, I, I think you're right, Caroline. And I think that's one of the reasons for today's discussion is to confront the truth, yeah. uh, which is spare. Uh, in in uh, our culture right now, and uh, to uh, to have a shared um, relationship. Um, I I promised that we were going to spend some time about Reconstruction and the post-war immediate post-war era, where 
some Union heroes like Phil Sheridan and William Sherman become consumed with the Indian Wars, so-called, and exacting revenge. Sheridan said, the only good Indian I ever saw was a dead Indian. And there's a statue of Sheridan in front of the New York State Capitol that's been a matter of contention for quite a few, well, for a couple of years, quite a few months, I was going to say. Um, the, let's talk about, well, I know Elena has done some research in the post-war era, particularly Iowa Senator James Harlan, who had an interesting relationship with Lincoln. I think in, in Yiddish it's called, he was Lincoln's mechutten. <laughs> a few of you at least know what that is. So his daughter was married to Lincoln's son, but not until Lincoln died, I think. So it's, very, it's a very interesting case, and one always wonders what Lincoln would have said to Harlan when there were family get-togethers. But please tell us about the post-war period. Okay, so not the family get-together. Right, okay. not the family get <laughs> um, So Harlan is so integral to my book, um, which really talks about how there was a parallel reconstruction project in Indian Territory, again, which is now um, today known as Oklahoma. Um, and so after the war, uh, Harlan, who is Secretary of Interior and is actually the last appointment made by Lincoln before his death, uh, he is a really big supporter of the Homestead Act. He really believes in kind of the Republican ideal of the small yeoman farmer making his own kind of homeland and life. Um, and so in creating really what become the, um, what is that called? I can't think of the word right now. Um, giving up at the end of the war. Surrender. Surrender, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Surrender. Um, these treaties need to be made between the five Indian nations that I study as well as pretty much every Indian nation because they are considered domestic dependent nations in, in 1832 Supreme Court case. And so they do need to reestablish their relationships just like the uh, Confederacy has to reestablish their relationship with the United States. And so Harlan really makes land ownership a portion of these treaties while at the same time taking hundreds of thousands of acres from native people. And so native people have to cede more land, but he makes these very key treaty provisions for the black people who were enslaved in these nations. And so he forces these five tribes to free all the slaves that they have in their nations, to give them citizenship and to give them land. And so you have this kind of entirely different project going on in Indian territory and where we may look at reconstruction as highly unsuccessful in the United States, it actually was largely successful in Indian territory um, because this land really allowed those black people who were, like my family, able to start communities, able to build houses, churches, have the kind of economic autonomy that really allowed them to start anew. Um, this economic autonomy that so many African Americans in the U.S. South did not have because they were soon pushed into things like sharecropping, systems that recreated slavery, essentially. Um, so Harlan and his kind of idea of what emancipation and reconstruction could look like, uh, he was really kind of allowed to have a lot of freedom in crafting this um, in Indian territory. And so that is such, I think, an important other part of the African-American post-Civil War experience that I'm kind of trying to get out to the world because I think a lot of people don't know many of those things, this, the slave owning, the treaties, um, and then how these treaties re really were the foundation for what eventually becomes uh, the land runs and all this native dispossession that then creates the state of Oklahoma. I, I must admit, I, until your book, I didn't know any of this about Harlan. Is there any, this may be wishful thinking from a one time hero worshiper, but is there any evidence that in their developing friendship in beginning in 64 and on, you know, with their children's engagement that Lincoln might have engaged with Harlan on discussing policy? I have not found it yet. I mean, I, I'm looking for some of his papers. I was actually contacted by someone after my book came out who 
I guess his law firm is now like what used to be Harlan's law firm. Like it has actually his papers. Oh, wow. It took over, I guess, the name. I think it maybe housed in the same building. Um, and so he's actually going to send me some of the correspondence that wow. he has with various people. Whether that's in there, I don't know. But So you've got an article left. One of the most exciting but also disheartening thing is when you write a book and someone calls you and says, I'm a descendant of so-and-so. <laughs> You didn't know about this, maybe you want to, you know, you try not to tell the world, as you just did. But it's exciting when it, when it, when it comes up. Um, Harlan's an, an, interesting, an interesting figure. The Lincoln children spend a lot of time in Iowa. Not just Robert, obviously, because it was his in-laws, but little Tad, uh, who was not so little in the late 60s, spent time in the Iowa home of the Harlan family. Just. What about Sherman and Sheridan? I mean, Sherman was making provisions for land for black people. It was kind of overridden, but his, in his surrender, original surrender terms, accepting the, the surrender of Johnston, but he doesn't seem to have extended his focus to Native Americans. Right, um, and I think that's, if anyone knows about kind of the, like what could have been with Reconstruction, that is often used as um, the idea of what could have been. Uh, Sherman, while he's traveling through the Sea Islands in South Carolina, um, he comes into contact with what are today known as Gullah Geechee people, um, who have a very kind of distinct African-American diasporic culture. Um, and he, the people tell him, what we need from you is land. We need to be able to farm and really kind of have this permanency in this place that we have lived and labored on for generations, for many of them. Um, and so special field order number 50 uh, really kind of created this idea, this plan really, that these people would break up their former owner's land and have allotments for each of them. Um, and then after the Civil War, uh, the Republicans were not really able to mount the kind of support needed to keep that going and to expand it into the United States, is which, um, which is what some of the more kind of radicals like Thaddeus Stevens really kind of were hoping for. Um, and so I think field orders, 50, and Sherman are kind of our picture into Republicans who weren't even necessarily very radical, but who did see the need for something after emancipation because a lot of former slave owners uh, were not willing to let go, obviously. Um, but at the same time, it was so difficult for many of these white men to imagine taking land from a white person and giving it to a person of color, mm -hmm. even if that person was a traitor, a former Confederate. Yeah. And then relegated many people who got the original land to a life of sharecropping and, and poverty. Um, I, I discussed Sand Creek really in passing. I think I would, we need to hear more about the Sand Creek massacre and why more people, I know some people did condemn Chippington, is that, that's his name, right? For well, because he wanted to be, he wanted to hire political office, but the the Sand Creek Massacre destroyed any opportunity for that. So there was some pushback, some pushback on him for his, uh, for his, um, his extraordinary acts with his men. So this is something that goes on when the focus of the press and you know, the government is on winning the war. I mean, it happens right after Lincoln's re-election. <clears throat> Was there outcry? I mean, we should talk more about what is the massacre? Yeah, I mean, to me, the massacre is actually just Evans and Shivington really realizing that their campaign with 3rd Regiment that they'd created in Colorado was bloodless. And they were like, oh, well, that's not really good for our political careers. Uh, and, you know, there's all these negotiations going on in the background. And we've got the, we originally you have the Treaty of Fort Laramie. Um, and then I think in 1961, another expert would have to correct me on this if I'm wrong, but Evans becomes the governor of Colorado, correct? Um, and then in, also I think in 60, 61 or 62, uh, they have to sign a new treaty, the Treaty of Fort Wise. And it, it essentially pushes the Cheyenne people um, to a very small portion in southeastern Colorado um, of largely unusable land. Um, and I want to say it was, you mentioned him in your opening, it was Black Kettle, Chief Black Kettle? Yeah. Um, who as a peace chief is attempting to negotiate with um, 
well, through another individual, but specifically with Evans, um, to not be engaged in a, in a fight, essentially. And there's some back and forth. Evans issues a first proclamation stating that he will, um, you know, as long as, the, as long as the Indians can get to their agencies, that that would be a space of replete for them. Um, and then at some point in time, he creates the third regiment. And then after that, he issues a second proclamation in which he makes it legal for uh, citizens to kill uh, Native Americans and take their property as payment for the killing. Um, Black Elk goes to Fort Lyon, or not Black Elk, Black Kettle goes to Fort Lyon and is um, there awaiting and then ends up at, at Sand Creek. And on the morning of November 29th, 1864, uh, Chivington, who is in charge of the military regiment, uh, decides that it's his best political move, I guess. Uh, to march and he takes his men and he slaughters uh, Native women children and elders at Sand Creek um, It is Incredibly violent. He actually his re his regiments largely untrained right the hundred dazers um, And by the time they get there, they're they're intoxicated um, But the, the acts of violence that they perpetuate against Native people during this massacre aside from just the killings are um, barbaric they scalp Native children, they scalp Native women, they take repeated scalps from the same Natives. Um, as you mentioned, they um, perform sexual mutilation on Native women. Uh, and then once they are finished, they take their body parts on a, on a parade through downtown Denver um, to demonstrate, uh, I guess, the success of their campaign. Yeah. Including fetuses, we should mention. Yes. They took fetuses out of women. And Paraded them as well. And, and Car we, we Car okay. Caroline, it wasn't even, excuse me, it wasn't even just Colonel Shivington. He was in collusion with the yes. governor of Colorado. With Evans, yes. John, John Evans, yeah. right? Isn't that right? Yeah. And he was condemned but never prosecuted, right? He was. So, so Shivington actually just straight up resigns from the military before he gets in trouble. Um, and you know, it's and it's it's we've actually brought up the Sand Creek ma uh, massacre in a few of our amicus briefs at NAWRC. Um, there's there's a clear sort of through line between this violence against Native women, in particular as leaders in their communities, um, that still exists today, including the removal of children from pregnant Native women. I don't know if anybody saw Savannah Graywin's case, uh, which occurred in Duluth, Minnesota, um, in which she was eight months pregnant, a young Native girl. Um, this was a couple years ago and uh, was taken by her downstairs neighbor, um, kidnapped, uh, and they performed a crude C-section on her while she was alive. They dumped her body into the Red River and kept her child. Um, and it was really only like the work of a couple of advocates that actually led uh, any sort of investigation into this case. But that type of violence against Native women has just been a constant through line uh, within sort of America's arc, right? Um, and. I guess if I could just talk maybe a little bit about my work too right now, you know, I know that 55% of Native women experience domestic violence, 56% of them will become victims of sexual assaults, and 96% of that violence is perpetrated by a non-Indian, and it has to do with what you just mentioned, with the jurisdictional issues and the kind of failure to prosecute in these situations, which, which is ongoing today. I mean, that's still the case today. There was actually a 1978 Supreme Court case called Oliphant v. Suquamish, which stripped tribes of their inherent authority to prosecute non-Indians for crimes committed in tribal land. That stuff matters today. You know, so, so a lot of these things that might have existed uh, pre-Civil War, Civil War, during Reconstruction, certainly like 1885 with the Major Crimes Act, Public Law 280 in 1953, like, you know, basically every decade of our history, there is some sort of policy in place uh, that directly impacts the safety of Native people. Um, and the Sand Creek Massacre is really just one event on a long line of those situations. But I think we needed to hear more about it. And the through line, as you put it, important. So we have time um, for your questions. And we have a microphone here. So I would invite anyone who has a question to please come up. You can take off your mask at the mic and then put it back on. Good, we have our first volunteer. <clears throat> as distressing, even depressing as these events are that we've been talking about a lot, equally distressing and depressing has been 
the virtual ignorance of the American public as to any of it. Uh, the first time I heard about it, and you know, I'd like to consider myself a reasonably educated individual, the Sand Creek Massacre was when I read a fictionalized account of it in the novel Centennial by, by James Lynch. And I looked it up and thought, this couldn't have happened. And was shocked that it actually did. Last year, we had the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa race massacre. I, I wonder why, in my 73 years, I've never heard of this before, you know? It, it, we really have whitewashed a lot of this history, no pun intended. But um, equally distressing and depressing is today's movement, very prevalent, very strong, to cover up all of these things, continue the whitewashing, and making us as a nation even dumber and more blind to some of these words on our history. Sorry, didn't mean to get on. Well, it's an it's a, it's a important statement. I don't know if there was a question, but that's okay. <laughs> we needed someone to start and get us into the moment. Anyone have any questions? Yes, come, come up, please. Of course. <laughs> Yeah, McGirt is a really interesting, I really love your sweatshirt, by the way, I'm sorry, a big call out to Urban Native. Um, so, um, McGirt was a really disturbing case, right? And as actually as a, as a native, as an advocate who focuses on anti-violence, uh, it was difficult, I think, even for our organization uh, to write the amicus brief that we wrote in that case. Um, and I think, so, so just so that everyone has the backstory on this, Jimmy McGirt was a uh, Native American man in Oklahoma um, on off what was technically off-reservation land. Um, and he sexually assaulted um, a, his granddaughter, I believe. Um, he was arrested con and convicted and prosecuted by the state of Oklahoma. Because when you, are, when you, commit, a crime in, when you commit a crime as a Native person, or if a crime is committed against you, it matters where you are, right? So he commits his crime off reservation land. Even as a native person, the state's gonna prosecute him, all right? And this is all really complicated and very rot. Um, he argued that the state of Oklahoma actually did not have the jurisdictional authority to prosecute and convict him because the United States Congress, which has plenary authority in Indian country, had not officially in any sort of congressional action abrogated their treaty meaning that the entire eastern half of the state of Oklahoma was still Indian country. So now you have a native man who has committed a crime, an atrociously horrific crime against a native child, and who is going to prosecute, right? And it kind of became a dog whistle, actually, because someone's going to prosecute. It's usually going to be the federal government in that instance, um, so I will tell you that. Um, but it was a... So I, I say the facts of the case to point out to everybody, in case you go home and read it later, that I acknowledge that it was not an ideal set of facts, right, for us to kind of set up this huge win for Indian country, because that's what it was. Um, ultimately, Neil Gorsuch, who writes the opinion, states that at the other end of the Trail of Tears was a promise and the United States needed to uphold it um, and found for the tribe, right, that the, that, that land was still Indian country. Now there's an ongoing debate around this, even right now, even today, actually, that's, that's, um, persisting both within the state of Oklahoma with Governor Stitt and also, uh, within the federal court systems. But, um, do I think that other tribes are going to attempt to utilize the argument? I would hope so, right? Um, treaty abrogation within U.S. courts, though, is, is more commonplace than treaty enforcement or upholding. Um, and I don't think anybody was really expecting, at least from a non-Indian perspective, Neil Gorsuch, to be the person to uphold that. Now, we all knew from his time uh, having served in the court that he served in prior to that he was actually very pro-Native uh, rights. But time will tell, right, to see. Yeah, but it's a really good question. I hope I answered it. I hope more Native tribes will do it. There's a lot of treaties out there that are worth enforcing. And I hope it's one of the last promises that, you know, that can be kind of kept. Let's, yeah, let's hope so, exactly. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, and I also want to point out that uh, the case that she was just discussing, McGirt, has an important connection to the period we're talking about, the yes, Civil War and Reconstruction yes. period, um, because the treaty that I've told you uh, freed black people in Indian territory, gave them rights, gave them land, the treaties of 1866 were so important to the like upholding of McGirt, um, or the McGirt case um, binding, because uh, this promise that, yes, you're ceding all this land, but you still have control and jurisdiction over this region, um, is really what was kind of the, the foundational key yeah. um, to this finding. And so something that was written over 100 years ago, I think a lot of people think of treaties as things that have just all been broken um, and then don't matter anymore. And so it was so important to Native people across the country to know that something could be upheld even in this kind of political context. Yeah, something other than uh, hunting and fishing, right? Which is usually all that's carved out. Questions? Uh, this, this young man's wife is about to give birth, so he's got one, so he should have been the first one to yeah. ask a question. Um, Go ahead. Hi, hi, my name is Wynn Rutherford. Um, question, were any of the Native Americans who supported the Confederacy treated any differently than Confederate soldiers? So were there any rights that were you know, taken away in, um, as, a, as a punishment for supporting the Confederacy? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, I mean, the treaties I'm talking about, they're really thought of as punishment mm -hmm. um, for this decision that's made. Uh, there are no such kind of corresponding punishments for Confederates. I mean, they get to keep their horses, officers, and all of these things that I'm sure many of you know. Um, but for the five tribes, really having all of their treaties that promised that they would have the land in Indian territory forever completely disregarded, I think, is one of the largest punishments that you could really think of. It's really taking away the tribal sovereignty that they're supposed to have, all because the United States didn't actually give any of the backup that they were supposed to give to these native people in the first place. It's in their removal treaties that if anyone ever bothers them, the US government's supposed to be there. That's why there are forts built in Indian territory. And that promise isn't upheld, and yet it's the five tribes who really suffer. Thank you. Thanks. Congratulations, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I know no one wants to line up, so I think we should be patient as each person <laughs> comes forward. I want to say thank you, first of all, because this is extremely educational, and as a former educator, 29 and a half years here in Miami, um, it's, um, it's heartwarming that we can have such a forum as this to be educated, become educated, okay, so that we then can educate those that come be behind us, okay. Um, the five tribes that you mentioned, and by the way, I am a partial Cherokee, so uh, yes. Um, it's interesting that there was the division, um, it, it seems to me, between the five tribes and then the others who were, I, I believe, originally um, uh, living in mid or maybe eastern U.S. and pushed out west. And then there, uh, for there to be such a difference, it sounds like, made between those tribes and the other five. Can you just expound on that? Uh, so the five tribes are some of the first to be pushed from the southeast where they're originally from to the farther west and it's really something that they've been doing um, especially the Cherokee since the early 1800s mm -hmm. um, but with what I guess probably people are taught of as the Trail of Tears Indian removal with that um, in the 1820s and 1830s they really become some of kind of the first what I would almost call settlers in a way of this region um, and so there are already Western people like the Osage, the Comanches come in and out of that area. And so they already are people who claim this place, but the five tribes are seen differently, as I kind of alluded to in my intro, by the federal government. So because they are seen as more civilized, more like white Americans, they're treated differently. And so they are almost treated like kind of a precursor to the white settlers who come later. And so there is an American defense of them. Um, 
to kind of return the violence of uh, Western peoples raiding them. Um, and so it really is kind of a surprise to the five tribes that there is no one that kind of comes to their aid because they had been given somewhat preferential treatment. And I'm saying preferential treatment, obviously they're still forced out of their homeland, so just to be clear, but. Um, yeah, they still had to go to Oklahoma. Right, <laughs> they wants to go there. Um, and you can see in the writings by even people like um, Commissioner Dole, who do think of Native people as a little better maybe than the average white person, he is respectful. It's still very much, they are more civilized and advanced and different because they're more like us. And look, they're farming and doing all of these things that we want them to, and thus maybe we should treat them a little better. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. With the recent advice from our governor, DeSantis, here in Florida, that we are not to teach any historical information that might provide discomfort to the students, well, I dare say that you see a trend here that the United States has been very Putinesque in co-opting Indian land, preventing black Americans, their rights, gay Americans, Jews, and we go on and on and on. And I love my country, don't misunderstand, but how do we disseminate the information here in the state of Florida without offending kids' sensibilities? Thank you. <laughs> Caroline, you're the, you're the Floridian here. You, yeah, well, you if you ask, I mean, the local and I will say, if you ask my students or really anybody that has met me, I show up very authentically as myself in all spaces, but, um, and I rarely, I mean, I hate saying this, but I don't know, it's, 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 how do we get, yeah, that's a really difficult question that could get me into trouble. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, you could argue, right, that we all teach race, we all teach critical race theory, um, all of us in our own way up here, that is what we do. Um, it's become a weird boogeyman of sorts. Um, but again, I think that it, ch children are, I mean, like even my son, my son is able to hear things and not feel, you know, he's like, oh, well, I didn't know that. Thank you for telling me. They're not, they're not, I don't know. I don't know where this notion is coming from other than racism and, and ongoing oppression. Um, but how do you, how do we get them to not feel like that? I don't think that they do feel like that. I think that they, I think that ch our children, and in particular our youth, have an incredible capacity to love um, and to learn from each other and to build good kinship with each other without, you know, inheriting, right, a lot of our own personal biases and prejudice. And yeah, I think it is up to a lot of adults, too, to make sure that those conversations are had inside of our homes. Um, but I don't know, I mean, it's, it's a difficult, that's a difficult question to answer. It, and, and it's odd. I mean, it's such an odd propaganda thing. I don't know if you want to add. I would say Florida is not the only state where this is No, Texas is, is doing it too. Right. Yeah, Virginia. Texas, yeah. um, so South this Dakota. is a, you know, this is a trope of, you know, ch parents exercising their rights to control curriculum. It's not, it's locality by locality to be sure, but it's not just Florida. It is weird too because if you, if, and I've had a few conversations with, I, I grew up in Texas primarily, um, and I have had a few conversations with individuals that um, I know in our family um, who, who have no idea what critical race theory actually is. And so if you ask them, you know, like, what, well, what is your opposition to learning about this in your school? What, what's your opposition to your child hearing about this? What they will tell you, that's not what it is though. You know, it's, it's, Whiteness is a societal construct that has benefited dominant society. Um, and if you talk about it as a construct versus as like an inherent trait somebody has just by the color of their skin, then it becomes, I don't know, less of a, it, it becomes easier to hear. But it's, it's the truth, it's reality. And people just have to learn, they have to hear it. And it might take two generations, but it'll happen. And you can't keep it out. Yeah. yeah. It's going to come out. Fortunately, young people have such tremendous access, for better or for worse, beyond the classroom, that there is no way to inhibit the, the dissemination of information, or, or unfortunately also misinformation. 
but there will be plenty of choices for them to make based on a lot of information. I never thought I'd say that about the web, but it may be the last best <laughs> hope, as Lincoln would say. With that, I want to thank Caroline Laporte, Elena Roberts, and Frank J. Williams, and George Amanillo. <laughs>